I want to ask you guys to demonstrate one of these network systems for us in just a minute. This is Windows Home Server in action. Although running as a VM, it's currently streaming a video onto my workplace machine. Ultimately, a market failure, Microsoft's attempt at the home server market placed Windows Home Server in direct competition with other NAS products by QNAP and Synology, just to name a few, yet even providing users a backup and restore facility somewhat reminiscent of Apple's Time Machine. Let's talk about legacy network technology. I'm the Vintage Collector and these are my stories. When introduced at the CES 2007 in Las Vegas by no other than Bill Gates himself, he might not have been receiving the huge buzz as when compared to earlier product introductions. Partnering up with HP to bundle Windows Home Server, the promise was huge. Information at your fingertips for any kind of documents and multimedia, an all-inclusive backup functionality, accessible from everywhere, anytime. According to one source, it was predicted that the market for home servers would be around 4% of all American households by 2012, so roughly 4.5 million households. Even have some of my favorite work clips. Can you believe he's the one that graduated from Harvard? <laughs> so it totally made sense for Microsoft to not let go of this market as third-party network attached storage servers were already entering the homes, bringing easy to set up compact but yet expandable file servers to the consumers. So with a pretty large footprint of desktop operating systems and a viable server OS at hand, Microsoft theoretically had everything to make it a success. Though, as of 2024, no one is talking about Windows Home Server anymore, it was obviously a market failure, with various media sites reciting on to why. But let's start at the beginning, with the basic installation experience, which, for the sake of simplicity, I'll conduct in a virtual machine. This gives you a similar experience as if you had bought the standalone version of Windows Home Server back then for installing on your own hardware. Of course, you could also have gone with a pre-built system to be comparable to NAS systems offered by QNAP or Synology. With HP being amongst the first, the initial list of available off-the-shelf systems was quite short when Windows Server came out by November 2007, though having grown significantly with the release of the second version of Windows Home Server 2011. Installing Windows Home Server to your own hardware certainly had its value as well, and with the license being sold for as low as 100 US dollars at the beginning, but eventually dropping down to 50 US dollars, it was a good buy. Although with some features reduced, the first version was based on Windows Small Business Server 2003, while the second was based on Windows Server 2008. I would have loved to show you the original RTM version, but I failed to acquire a proper license. You can find plenty of ISO copies on archive.org, but none of them carries a valid license key. So, for the sake of demonstration purposes, here's the beta 2 of Windows Home Server 2007, which is an interesting beast. While the Windows PE used to start the installer is clearly coming from Windows Vista, the remainder of the setup still looks a lot like Windows XP or Windows Server 2003. Once the installation finishes, it's surprisingly rough around the edges, like here, as it's just opening Internet Explorer as a startup item to tell you that you shouldn't be working off disk desktop on a regular basis. 
The store menu itself is very minimalistic, as pretty much everything has been spared away. The main distinct feature of the product is anyway the Windows Home Server console, which lets you configure your hard drives, file shares, user accounts and system backups. I won't be going into these yet, as the Beta 2 is an unfinished product and from what I've read about Windows Home Server 2007, the latter was significantly extended by so-called power packs, three of which were released through the product lifetime. One key functionality shall be noted though, albeit absent in the beta version. Windows Home Server 2007 obviously had a feature called Drive Extender, which according to my understanding was taking any given file and distributed to all available hard drives so at least two replicated copies would exist. Now, it shall not be understood as RAID, as it was not a RAID. Drive Expander literally worked with any size and number of hard disks and didn't seem to require any configuration, literally making this distributed file replication just work. And apparently this feature was then removed for the second release, Windows Home Server 2011, with Microsoft arguing it had become obsolete as vendors started to add proper RAID to their home servers anyway. So, as I'm installing here Home Server 2011, I won't be able to show that feature to you. Visually, the second version is closer to the Windows 7 and Server 2008 design language and also the Home Server console has a sleeker, more modern appearance. The server console provides you with a checklist of activities to run, like configuring the backups, setting up your accounts, file shares and even the web-based remote access. The latter is not strictly speaking a requirement, at least not from within the internal LAN. Upon enabling it, it offers you to configure your router via universal plug and play, so as in to enable public access to your Windows Home Server from the internet. I opted to not allow it to configure the network router, neither did I bother to set up an internet domain name, as this would be terribly insecure and dangerous to place the Windows Home Server directly into the internet. Windows Home Server 2007 was end of support since January 2013, hence no new updates, especially no security fixes have been released since. Windows Home Server 2011 was under coverage until April 2016 and left out in the rain since as well. Officially, you can't update either version of Windows Home Server through Windows Update anymore, but if you're opting to install LegacyUpdate.net, you can at least bring them up to the last known good patch state. So I strongly advise you not connecting it directly into the internet, but for the sake of demoing it, it's okay from the local LAN. For this to work I'll create the first user account, which I meant to read TPC, but because of a typo going by unnoticed it became TOC. And if you remember my last video about Microsoft Bob, which didn't create standard Windows accounts but its own thing, you may be relieved to see the account reappearing in the default local user and groups management. So even so, when creating an account through the home server console, you're doing essentially the same as if you were going through the Microsoft Management Console and in fact creating a standards compliant Windows user account. Back to the web UI, this is reachable from within your local area network simply by typing in your Windows Home Server's host name. I chose WHS2011 during the setup as a hostname, so this is what I'm typing in, in here into the browser's address line of my client machine, http colon slash slash WHS2011. Upon reaching the portal, it would switch over to TLS for using encryption, which would result into an invalid certificate warning. This is the result of me not performing the proper hostname setup beforehand. Now, in the real world, you should never access a website throwing certificate errors at you, but as I'm in a sandbox network, I know what's going to happen, so I'm accepting to continue anyway. And this is what the web UI looks like, providing you access to your stored files by the means of a web browser. But from a Windows client machine within your own local network, you'd certainly not use the web browser for accessing your data. 
Of course, one would use the Windows Phone Sharing Protocol called Server Message Block, SMB for short. As with any ordinary Windows Phone Server, you can simply access the phone through the UNC path name, like opening backslash backslash WHS 2011 here to show all available resources. Windows Home Server brought its own client connector, which was available for both Windows and even Mac clients. Simply opening https colon slash slash whs2011 slash connect in your web browser is enough to get to a download page. Upon running the client connector setup, it will ask for the server's administrative password and also bring up the option to configure an automatic system backup. Speaking of backups in particular, there's two kinds of backups. On the server side, you'll have to provide the system a dedicated disk where all data is going to be backup too. This can be either an internal or an externally connected drive. You get the full control of what's going to be included with the backup and upon inspecting said backup drive you see that obviously some kind of imaging technology is being used as you'll end up with some virtual hard disk files going by the VHD file extension. This system level backup of the server would as well include the client side backups. But beware, the client side backups don't end up directly on the dedicated backup drive in the first place. The frequency of how often the client backups are run can be set from the Windows Home Server console. When the client backups are performed, they end up in the server folders in the first configured hard disk, d column backslash server folders backslash client computer backups in my example. Now, it's a pity that the online help doesn't really explain how the client backup works, only how to configure it. So while the backup was running, I was observing the client's event log, which was pointing me at some activity of VSS during the backup run. VSS is the virtual shadow copy service of which I saw VSSVC.exe running. VSSVC.exe is the volume snapshot service and so it's obvious that volume shadow copies seem to be used to assist in the creation of the differential snapshots. And it also seems to be really clever overall, as when adding a second Windows 7 client machine and having it perform a backup as well, the resulting backup set found in the client computer backups folder didn't grow as much as I had expected. Giving the typical client setup consuming roughly 16GB and I have two of those, the total sum of backups would be like 32GB. Here's the initial backup size on the server, equating to roughly 11.8 GB. Obviously some level of compression is applied and even some deduplication is happening as when comparing the actual client backup folder on the server after adding the second client, it waits in for only roughly 14 GB combined. Now, of course you can perform file level restores of deleted files. As you see, you'll simply access previous snapshots through the home server console and navigate to the given folder to locate and restore the files in question. But apparently, it's also possible to recover an entire client machine. While Windows Home Server 2007 provided a recovery CD-ROM image, Windows Home Server 2011 allows the creation of a USB key. 
So I added a USB key as a pass-through device to VirtualBox and had Windows Home Server create the recovery key. However, there is no direct way to boot off a USB key in VirtualBox, hence I had to switch over to VMware to demo the recovery. On startup, it will discover the Windows Home Server and offer me the individual backups of the client machines. However, when restoring the client, I mistakenly tripped into the situation that it would not allow me to restore the actual OS partition, mainly because the backup image was 64GB in size and my target partition was only a bit over 60GB. So the restoration is bound to the disk image size and does not adapt to smaller disks. I then essentially reconfigured the VM to have a bigger virtual hard drive, making it 80GB in size. On the second run, the restore wizard detected the disk suitable in size and offered directly to restore, as the backup image would be fitting now, leaving me a restore client machine afterwards. Needless to say, this wouldn't work with Mac clients, as the latter would still rely on Time Machine for the backups. And to add for further restrictions, Windows Home Server wasn't compatible with Time Machine. I read though that HP developed the Windows Home Server add-in to make it compatible with Apple's Time Machine, though I didn't have access to said add-in. Speaking of add-ins, it's anyway a hard time. Add-ins were thought as a means to extend the capabilities of Windows Home Server and at the time somewhat 100 add-ins had been developed. However, most point to nowhere these days and are even by means of the Internet Archive impossible to retrieve. There were add-ins for various functions, so be it to extend the built-in web portal, adding MySQL, PHP, capabilities to host WordPress and many more. One that I would have been particularly interested to see was the Advanced Management Console, though it's long gone as well. I ultimately found an earlier beta version on archive.org, but this one obviously doesn't work correctly, as even though it installs, it wouldn't appear in the add-ins list on the home server console afterwards. Pity, as I really would have loved to see this, especially as the stock home server console doesn't offer too many functions. Aside from what we have seen so far, it has some functionality to look at the system level alerts and send some alert emails. All you need is an SMTP server and a mail account to send out those alerts, which gives you something like this. Going back to where I started off, Windows Home Server was not only meant to organize your data, but to provide for multimedia functions, streaming in particular. For that, you can enable the multimedia server in the Home Server console and define which file types it should serve. The moment you enable it, it will start to announce itself in the local network by means of the UPnP protocol, which makes it appear for selection, as you can see here in Video LAN. Even Windows Media Player, that still comes with Windows 11 these days, will locate it and play the media of the server. Literally any UPnP and DNLA compatible media player, including setup boxes and smart TVs, would detect your Windows Home Server at the present day and grant access to the multimedia content. We just wanted to change the world one desktop at a time. So what do you think about Windows Home Server? Was it a half-hearted product which failed for good reasons and simply too late in the market or was it just underestimated and not given enough time to catch on and mature? Let me know in the comments below. I'm the Vintage Collector and this was my story. Thanks for watching and see you again next Sunday.